This is the current federal tax developments for the week of July 22nd, 2024. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and by your state society of CPAs. Here from the rather nice and toasty Phoenix, Arizona, I'm Ed Zollers, and we're going to talk to you about a few things that happened this week. First, we're going to talk about a taxpayer who discovers that you can't simply rely on tax software to prepare your return, even if you're not going to be confirmed as the Secretary of Treasury. So a repeat of the old Geithner issue that came many, many years ago, we have a taxpayer who gets taken basically up again because they simply put garbage into a tax software and of course, not surprisingly, they got garbage out. We're also gonna talk about the fact the IRS finalized a series of regulations under the SECURE Act, the SECURE 2.0 Act that deals with required minimum distributions. And a key issue here is this deferral of having to take distributions in year one to nine if your client inherited an IRA from a decedent that passed away after 2019, that delay will no longer apply next year because we've now taken the regulations final. So we had a series of notices that push those back. That will no longer be true in 25. So 24 is your last year when you can decide to skip the distribution and not get penalized. And finally, in addition to, because again, remember these proposed regs are written out of SECURE Act, but in the interim, we got the SECURE 2.0 Act. Uh, we have a series, or basically some proposed regulations that deal with items the IRS felt were too significant a level of change for required minimum distribution items in the SECURE 2.0 Act for the IRS to simply update the regulations that were proposed in the regular SECURE Act and issue those. They have updated a number of things in the regular SECURE Act you know, they're in the SECURE 2.0 Act that are simple things like just changing a year or changing an age. That really is no interpretation involved, but they have done a separate section. And the big thing in those regs is going to be dealing with the ambiguity of what is the applicable date after which you must hit the required beginning date by April 1st, the following year, to start taking in distributions if you were born in 1959. As we discussed earlier, there are two answers to that question in the law. Obviously, we need to have one to really do something. So the IRS has chosen an answer. And if Congress doesn't act in the next eight years, there's a high probability that this answer will become the answer. So basically, Congress, if you don't like it, go ahead and make the technical corrections you're supposed to be making to the SECURE Act. So let's start first with the case of Pope versus Commissioner. This is Tax Court Summary Opinion 2024-15. This came down from the tax court on July 17, 2024. Now, this is a case of a taxpayer who's looking to prepare basically husband and wife joint return. Uh, the wife is looking to prepare the tax returns for them. So she handled the tax return. She's gotten this tax software to do it. So she's going to take care of handling it. Now, during the year, her husband had contributed $4,911.72 to a 401k plan that was shown on his W-2. And she also knew that there were other amounts deferred by his employer. Now, the court doesn't tell us whether these were just employer contributions to a qualified plan, if it was a non-qualified plan or what it was. But nevertheless, she knew that there was all this retirement stuff that went on at her husband's employer. And of course, she's preparing the 1040 using tax software. We're not told which software, but she got to this point, you know, on the front page, right? Schedule one, I should say schedule one now, that talks about deductible IRA contributions for your retirement. And she decided that something should be on that line. And her theory was that if something shouldn't have been there, well, the tax software would correct that, right? So what she did was she claimed a deduction for $14,000 for contributions to his IRA. And she based this on the $4,911.72 found W-2, and then her estimate of how much additional funds had been deferred at her husband's job. And that's how she got the 14,000. Not surprisingly, there were no actual contributions to any IRA accounts. Remember, what she's working with now are amounts were excluded from the husband's wages, right? Such as the 1099, the 401k contributions would be excluded, and any employer contributions, to a qualified plan would generally be non-taxable, the employee in the year paid in. 
And assuming you designed your non-qualified plan properly, that would also be true about any amounts the employer had committed toward a non-qualified deferred comp arrangement. So effectively, as we all know, that was already not in their income. But she thought, I mean, she's preparing to return, she sees this line, she thinks she should put something on it, so she put the 14000 in there. Not surprisingly, the tax software, of course, claims a deduction for 14000 Eventually, the IRS looks around and they're looking for, you know, the 5498 that tells them how much went in the IRA. And of course, none ever show up for this couple, either one husband or wife. And that's where we get the problem. The IRS therefore issues their standard notice to her, said, um, hey, guys, uh, as far as we can tell, you made no IRA contributions, at least no, no custodians reporting that money went into an IRA account for either of you. So... They come back, they say, nope, sorry, we're going to increase your income by $14,000 and charge you tax plus interest, right? Penalties aren't really discussed here. My suspicion is the IRS had agreed to waive the penalties uh, based on her I didn't know better theory, uh, but she was going to court trying to get out of paying the tax and the interest on the tax. So, you know, and she said, well, really, she just assumed the tax software would have alerted her if this was an error, not claiming the IRA deduction. And since the software didn't say anything about her putting these numbers in, didn't stop her, didn't tell her it was wrong, uh, well, she really shouldn't be responsible, right? And they should be responsible for paying this tax bill the IRS had sent them based on this concept. As you can guess, that's not really going to go too far. Uh, it sounds great, except not in reality. It's one of those things that's just kind of, nah, it doesn't really work that way. What the court pointed out was that, okay, let's go. As we're all aware, under the law, the taxpayers are not entitled to an IRA deduction under Section 219. And most likely, even if they had made the contributions to the IRA, which they hadn't, they would at least had, you know, his would probably at least have been disallowed because he was covered by a plan. Assuming your income was high enough, they could afford to make a contribution. Generally, that's going to kill it. And it's probably going to kill it if from the wife's side, too, even if she wasn't covered by a plan or spouse was. And again, the income's high enough. And again, based on my history, there are certain income levels beyond which you have to get before people actually start considering making IRA contributions. And usually my, my line has been for a while that if you're above that level, you probably don't qualify for a deduction if you have an employer plan. Same basic issue here. So in any event, they didn't get their deduction under 219 because even if they had had income low enough to qualify for the deduction, the problem is they hadn't made a contribution. So no contribution, no deduction. That's how it works. Because no IRA was ever funded by them. That's mechanically a problem. Now, what about this part, though? Look, I'm just a poor person. I went down. I got this tax software. They, you know, it says, hey, we'll do your taxes. You know, I really don't want to pay somebody to handle them for me, right? Uh, I don't want to do them by hand. Doesn't this just take care of it? Don't, don't I just I have nothing to do? And the court said, look, the IRS publishes instructions for Form 1040. And even if you're using tax software, you need to consult and follow those instructions and do it properly. The tax software does not relieve you of your obligation to prepare the return correctly. Right? That's still your obligation. Now, obviously, if you don't believe you're up to that, right, you don't, or you don't want to spend time reading those instructions, then um, you can hire somebody to handle it. That's the way it would work. But otherwise, you, know, you can't get out of it just by saying, oh, I didn't look at that. I just gave it to the software. As we all know, there's really no way the software could have known, you know, did you actually put money in an account? Uh, one real problem we run into sometimes with people in this software is they have trouble, even if the software tries to ask that question, they don't necessarily understand what it's asking or they start reasoning, well, you know, he put money in this 401k and that's a retirement account. And this says individual retirement account. Well, that's his retirement account. He's an individual. So yeah, we did that. And then the employer put money in his individual retirement account, right? His account in the plan, that's his individual account, right? So then they, then they just reason themselves into this sort of thing, which unfortunately is not going to work. IRA has a specific meaning, which had she read the instructions, maybe she would have figured that out. But 
doesn't matter. And so the court says, well, clearly you owe the tax. There is no way you're getting out of this tax, you know, essentially as court would tell you, well, that's kind of unfair to the people that didn't screw up their return and put a $14,000 non-existent deduction on it and paid the tax, letting you get away with not paying it by putting non-existent deductions on the return. That's not really a way to run this thing. So we're going to have to ask you for the tax. And we also, as the court says, the generally the courts cannot grant relief except in very, and even the IRS cannot grant relief from interest due on underpayment, except in very, very limited circumstances. And as the court noted, these circumstances were not in play here. The mistake was entirely the taxpayers. The IRS did not even, you know, you can't even get to the point we misled. They didn't delay, you know, th this whole thing. The IRS just simply said, here it is. Here's what you owe. Here's your interest. Pay up. And well, you know, that that's kind of how it goes. Now, as I said, th this goes back to similar to the case involving Timothy Geithner, remember former Treasury Secretary, uh, who when he came, he came to prominence by being the you know chair of the New York Fed during the uh, 2008 uh, financial crisis, and so was selected to be the Treasury Secretary when the President Obama came in, right? Here's the Treasury Secretary, he was there. We're trying to get through this thing, they bring him in. Of course, it turns out that he had also decided Somewhat weirdly, considering that he should have realized he kind of had better things to do to prepare his return, uh, you know, and in his case, it was a weird, and it was definitely a weird rule that involves payments from the World Bank and how because they're not subject to FICA, they will be subject to, under special rules, the self-employment tax. And yeah, that's not something that you're going to find out reading the basics in TurboTax. I even have my doubts you'd figure it out from reading the instructions to 1040 right? Because it is so obscure. But nevertheless, yeah, you can't rely whether it's Timothy Geithner being confused about self-employment tax in the World Bank, or whether it is in this case, Mr. and Mrs. Pope being confused about an IRA deduction. Paying, you know, saying the tax software did, it's not going to help you. By the way, it doesn't help you as a tax pro either. It doesn't matter if, let's say, UltraTax computed this and they did it wrong. Um, we're still responsible for that computation. You know, we can't just kind of force it off on ultra tax and say, oh, sorry, taxpayer. You know, yeah, we fouled this up and yeah, you, you know, you owe way more, but you know, the ultra tax made a mistake. It's not our problem. Yeah, it doesn't work either. Next up, we now have final regulations issued on required minimum distributions on the SECURE Act and the SECURE Act 2.0. Now, we had discussed these proposed regulations way back in 2022 when they first came out. But let's go ahead and let's kind of review where we're at because what happened was these proposed regulations were released in 2022. Remember, the original SECURE Act was passed in December of 2019. Now, as I said, that was a tax law nobody actually studied in detail because everybody's going to get that picked up in their continuing education once, you know, basically, in, you know, after they got through the tax season in 2020. And of course, 2020 with COVID, et cetera, the tax season never ended or effectively seemed to never end. And everybody was being trained on PPP loans and then ERC and all that other stuff. So this is that act that kind of nobody ever got around to looking at in detail, which is kind of bad because there are a lot of significant changes there. But the RMD changes most people are aware of, right? Uh, now, before those regulations could be finalized, right, they issued those in February of 2022. And before they could be finalized, at the end of 2022, Congress passed the SECURE 2.0 Act, which made more changes to retirement plans. Right? If you remember, this was Representative Brady and Representative Neal's uh, basically pet project. Uh, Representative Neal at the time uh, was the chair of the House Ways and Means. Representative Brady was the former chair of Ways and Means and the ranking Republican. And they had been working on this project for years. Representative Brady was basically, he did not run for re-election in 2022. So this was like their last chance as a team to put it through. And they actually did. So that's how the second pair of changes came in in 22. But in any event, they did make some changes and some of those changes did affect the RMD rules. Okay. So in any event, what happened was 
one of the major provisions in the original act, this was not really changed by the Secure 2.0 Act, was the elimination of most stretch IRA programs. And what they required was, instead, remember in the old days, you would take this IRA account, let's say I've got, let's say, got $300,000 in IRA account. Um, I would make the beneficiary of that account the youngest possible relative that I wanted to have benefit from my estate. So let's say it might be a great grandchild. And I would leave the entire balance of that IRA, whatever was left over when I died, would be left to that great grandchild who, you know, at my death, let's say, is six years old. That would allow that to be stretched over her life expectancy, which at six years old is going to be quite a few years. Right. So we could do those stretch IRA programs. And in theory, if that, you know, it would go out over her life expectancy, even if she didn't live out the life expectancy, it would still go over that life expectancy because once we got our factors, we just paid out under that. That could allow the IRA to be stretched a long time. And if it was a Roth IRA, it could grow tax free during all of those decades, right? While we're stretching out to the life expectancy of a six year old, which is going to be not as long as you might expect initially, uh, but it gets, you know, the life expectancy. The problem is there are some individuals who die in childhood, who die in any particular year. Some people age A do not get to age A plus one each year. So the more years you live, the more, the older your, basically your life expectancy, the older the age that you die is expected to be because you weren't the group bringing down the average who didn't make it from 24 to 25. So, you know, they, they brought down the averages some. So that's kind of how that works. But in any event, it would still be a nice long, you know, amount held. And we would go ahead and be able to use that. They got rid of that. The stretch IRA was gone. It was one of the things they used to raise money for the, uh, basically to pay for the other parts of Secure Act that had a cost to the Fed Treasury. That was how they did it. Now, let's talk about the general rule added by the Secure Act. As a general rule, so long as there is a designated beneficiary for the account, right? And that is a defined term. And that term was defined under the old law. But as long as we have one of those and that person is not an eligible designated beneficiary, which is a whole different subcategory, or basically it's a, it's a subcategory of eligible beneficiary, of designated beneficiary is eligible designated beneficiary, right? The entire balance must be distributed. So we have that, like, let's say my beneficiary, let's say to this IRA, uh, let's say instead of being, you know, great grandchild, it's simply my daughter. So I leave it to my daughter, right? Simple rule. Well, in that case, regardless of how old my daughter is when I die and the IRA funds pass to my daughter, uh, I would have to distribute the entire balance out of the plan by the end of the 10th year following year of death. And that 10 year rule applies regardless of whether or not the decedent had lived beyond his or her required beginning date and thus had received a required, thus was receiving required minimum distributions. Now let's go back and apply what these rule, what these terms mean. The required beginning date generally is the April 1st of the year after the beneficiary of the account, be an IRA or employer plan, reaches their age, their applicable age. The applicable age will be uh, essentially, it was 70 and a half for a long time. The Secure 2.0 Act took it to 72. Uh, we're now at 73, right? And eventually it will go to 75. Okay, so that's considered one in pay status. Even if you already reached, let's say, age, let's say this year you have a taxpayer reached age 73 in 2024, they will not be considered in pay status if they take that RMD, the first RMD in 24, which they can, right? You have a choice to take it in 24 or take it in 25 or split it between 24 and 25, but any part in 25 has to be paid by April 1st. Uh, even if they took that, that amount that would be considered a required distribution in the following year, um, 
it, they're not yet in pay status until they actually reach April 1st that following year. In essence, they didn't have to have taken it. So that distribution does not have to be considered a required minimum distribution. That's basically how the rule works uh, for that particular structure. So they hadn't reached their required beginning date, so they weren't required to take the distributions. A little bit weird, but if they hadn't got past that date, we're fine, right? Then we could do it. And whether or not they're past that date, this 10-year rule applies. Under the prior law, if somebody died before they started the distribution, before the distribution is required to be paid out, they died before that date, then the law provided that you could take that out over the five years, or you know, anytime during the five years following year of death, or if you started doing so in the first year after the person died, you could take it out over your life expectancy in the year following the year the person died, and you would spread it over that period. That'd be your choice. And if you, but if you were, you know, your benefit, your the person you inherited from was already in pay status. You had to take it over your life expectancy, or you could use theirs. And there are some weird cases where you'd want to use theirs instead of yours. Uh, but, you know, basically it could be done either way. Uh, now we're going to say in that second category, or the first category, we're not going to make it five years anymore. But we're going to get rid of that life expectancy long-term stretch out. We're going to say it doesn't matter by the end of year 10, that thing goes to zero, period, right? But what happened, the IRS noticed, well, that was adding the law. The IRS noted that IRC section 401A9AAII was not repealed or overridden by the act. Now that section provides what's considered to be the distributions when distributions have already begun because of the RMD rules, uh, basically, the distributions have, have already begun and they die before their entire interest is distributed to them, so they're in pay status. Then the remaining portion of such interest will be distributed to that to the heir at least as rapidly as under the method of distribution being used prior to the date of death by the decedent. That law was not that part of the law was not changed. This is where things get messy because a lot of people had read, and it's weird the way they wrote the law. It's weird how they hop over things. And some people decided, well, this would only apply if you weren't a designated beneficiary. If there's no designated beneficiary, then this rule would apply, but otherwise it wouldn't. However, the IRS said there's actually nothing in the law that suggests that that, at least as rapidly rule, no longer applies if you're, you know, let's say an eligible benefit, a designated beneficiary, and, you know, and the things in pay status, no, both rules apply. That means that effectively you've got to meet both rules, right? Now, remember, a designated beneficiary is under the prior law. It meant, at least as rapidly meant, you had to start taking it over the life expectancy of the designated beneficiary. With the shortest life expectancy, if all beneficiaries of that account were designated beneficiaries. And we usually work like mad to make sure they were by our deadline of September 30th, the year following year of death. And usually we'd like to get just one beneficiary in each account we're making distribution from. So we divide the IRA up into various subparts. So if there were three beneficiaries, we'd have three separate inherited IRAs. There are two great reasons for that. Reason one, I don't need to, I don't need to worry about investing the same way my brother and my sister do. Family fights are avoided that way. Uh, and number two, everybody uses their own life expectancy. It's not like you know, our oldest sister is just absolutely hurting us because we have to take it out faster because she's old. You know, yeah, that, that, that could be a problem. So, you know, they, they fix all that. Now, remember, entities, which includes the states, charities, and the like, essentially are not as well beneficiary. You can think of it as they have a life expectancy, life expectancy of zero years. If you have one of those beneficiaries left on the account, your only real option is to take it over the remaining life expectancy of the decedent at their death, under this at least as rapidly rule. We just keep using their number, right? But based on their life expectancy at their death, that's what we have to do, or take it all out the next year. You got two options to do there. Now, eligible beneficiaries are determined as of December 30th of the year following year of death. 
under those regulations. We cannot add an eligible beneficiary, but we can subtract one. So for instance, you couldn't have your beneficiary be, you know, my children, you know, all of my children and grandchildren, as long as they're born before September 30 of the year following the year of my death. And if you have a grandchild born, therefore, in September 1st of the year following your death, that grandchild can't be added as an eligible beneficiary, right? You can't add them. You can only subtract them, right? But what we can do by September 30 is pay out the church, right? Pay out any sort of charity we have in there, right? Now, estates are a bit more troublesome. Some private letter rulings have been received over the years where if the only heir in the estate is a surviving spouse, they would treat it as if it was a look-through trust, and essentially, you know, fine, treat it. But those have all been PLR required to get that going. Generally, you don't want to leave the IRA to the estate. If you can avoid it, and if you're leaving it to a trust, make sure that your trust qualifies as a look-through trust. Right? That, that can be somewhat important under these rules as to how we get those out. Okay. Now, here's the catch. Many commentators had read the Original Secure Act provision to say, okay, we don't care. You inherited an IRA from your mother. Um, regardless of whether your mother was age 52 or age 92, you would have to take no money out of the account for the first nine years. You could leave everything in there until the end of year 10. And if it was a Roth IRA, it would make a lot of sense to do that, right? Okay, so you do that and that, that would be fine under the law. The IRS said, no, that's not how this law works. The IRS said, essentially, sorry, guys, we don't do that. So you couldn't do what people were advised to do in 2021. Because remember, the proposed regs didn't come out until 2022. So you're already too late. If mom died in 2020, you're already too late in 21 to you know, take the distribution that was required in 21 for you because that year was gone, right? And we're already into 22. So basically we'd already been there. So what they had told people though back then was, well, don't worry about it. You know, mom died in 2020. You're going to have to take nothing through 2021 to 2029. And then in 2030, you'll have to take whatever's left in there out. That's what they, that's how they interpreted it as working. That would mean the rain bounce come out year 10. Okay. Now, and that provision was already been used, irrevocably used by many taxpayers for 2021 required distributions where the Cena died in 2020. The heirs had not taken distributions because their financial advisor, maybe their CPA, maybe their attorney, maybe their EA had told them that no money had to come out. Now the IRS is saying, hey, look, that, that section was never repealed. And these proposed regs, which are still which were still proposed, but they're kind of concerning now, said, hey, you should have taken something out in 21, and you didn't. Do you owe the penalty on failing to do it? And so there was lots of angst, lots of screaming, you know, lot, lots of complaining to the IRS over this issue, right? Because those proposed regulations says that's not how it works, right? Rather, the distribution has to satisfy both the annual distribution rule based on the shortest life expectancy of the designated beneficiary is September 30th, the year following year of death. And again, that assumes all beneficiaries were designated beneficiaries at that point on the account. Right? Like I said, in the real world, we tend to get it down to one. And each one who's a qualified designated beneficiary can then use this rule. But they still have to take distributions every year from year one to nine. So mom dies in 2022. In 2023, you should have taken for the portion of the IRA for mom that you inherited and now sits in your inherited IRA. You should have taken a life, you know, a distribution based on your life expectancy in 2024, right? Whatever that was. She died in 22, I said, so 23, right? And this year you would take it. You take that 2023 life expectancy number, divisor, subtract one, divide that in the beginning of your balance and take that this year. And you do that every year through the ninth year until we get to mom died in 22. So all the way through to 2031, we're gonna keep using that table just like nothing had changed. However, 
When we get to 2032, then we have to clear out the entire remaining balance, right? So any remaining balance has to be distributed in its entirety in year 10. That's a requirement under the proposed regs. And the same rule applies, although it never really would have come into play yet. If your client, well, I guess it could have. If, if you had somebody who died, they had a minor child that was a beneficiary of their IRA, that's one of the group of things called eligible designated beneficiaries who are allowed to continue to use life expectancy. Now, for all of those except the minor child rule, that's the minor child of the deceased. So it's not your grandchild, great-grandchild, niece, nephew, none of that counts. Got to be your, chi your minor child. Uh, they could take it over their life expectancy calculation, right, up till they reach age of majority. And then the 10-year rule would come in play. The IRS did rule in the proposed regs, something I'm worried about till now because really probably didn't matter or had limited applicability because it kept waiving this. Uh, they need to keep taking distributions under that rule if they did the eligible, eligible designated beneficiary rule, get that out correctly. They need to keep taking those distributions over their life expectancy in, you know, in the nine years after they reach majority. And then again, everything else comes out at the end of that 10th year. So in essence, what happens is eligible minors, minor children, if they want to go the life expectancy route, because let's say that dad was not in pay status, which often, if dad had a minor child, there's a decent chance dad's under 59 and a half. Um, and if that's true, then, you know, then basically, yeah, we're going to get to take it till the minor child reaches age of majority, which is 21 under the regs. And then they'll have 10 years after that. So basically, if somebody inherits as a minor child, they keep taking it using their life expectancy every year until they reach age 30, 30, right? Year 30, age 30, they take the last one under that rule. Age 31, the rest of it comes out of the account. So that's the rule they had in the proposed regs. Now, laws allowed to stretch IRAs only for those, for benefits inherited from a de de decedent who died prior to 2020. So those are still fine. Those didn't change and the eligible designated beneficiaries, which in addition to the minor child under the weird special rule would also include the spouse of the deceased, would include an individual who was chronically ill or disabled, would include a beneficiary that was no more than 10 years younger than the deceased, right? So basically rules like that, people that would have relatively short life expectancies is how they were looking at it. People in that case, or the spouse already had all these options to play with. So we let those things be allowed for our eligible designated beneficiary rules, right? So they get it. In those cases, life expectancy payouts beyond the 10th year were allowed, right? And you still have to start taking them in year one, but you're allowed to take them beyond the 10 years. So we could keep going with those ones if they live more than 10 years beyond the year that dad, you know, dad died, right? But if that person, if that, if either one of these, those inherited the benefits from somebody who died before 2019 or the person who inherited the benefits, you know, and is an eligible, as eligible designated beneficiary, if they die before that IRA account is totally paid out, then the next heir in line, you know, the person that they designate will get it if they die before the money gets all the out of the account, they will be under the 10 year rule. And if that account was already in a pay status, right, where they had to take life expectancy distributions, then they're going to keep taking it until year 10. That's the way it works. Now, due to all the comments the IRS received about this, we've been operating under a series of notices that for every year from 2021 to 2024, so basically four years, 21, 22, 23, 24, the distributions in those years that would have been required under the life expectancy rule for an IRA in pay status for a beneficiary for a individual, a decedent that died after 2019, those have all been no penalties would be required has been part of the deal. Now these were notices 2022-53, 2023-54, uh, 2024-35. Those have been the ones that took us through. The 2022 notice covered 21 and 22. 
the 2023 notice covered 23, and the 2024 notice covered this year. As I said, when we discussed those notice 2024, 35 this year, that one had said that it was expected the regulations would be final before the end of the year. So that was gonna be the last time you'd be able to defer, which kind of telegraphs they expected these regs to require distribution. Hey guys, they do. These notices says no penalties be imposed on the air, nor there be any uh, penalties or actions, sanctions taken on any qualified retirement plans that failed to make such distributions from a defined contribution account under these particular fact circumstances. Right, so now we're gonna say end of the game for 2024, 35 will be the last one of these issued. It will only cover 24. So according to the reg, 25, it will be required, right? We've already been told that if the reg was final by the end of this year, and it is already now final, sorry, there will not be another relief notice put out. Now, I, that doesn't mean they couldn't do it. If somebody screamed loud enough, I guess, but it seems unlikely that we're going to see another relief notice. Again, this is one of those things where if Congress meant something different, Congress can pass a law to take that out. They, the fact they didn't do that in Secure 2.0 is what convinced me that we're going to get this. Congress had a chance to say specifically, nope, guys, you, you other people were right. That's what we meant. And just changed the law and they neglected to do so. That can be seen as indirect evidence that Congress believes the IRS has got it right. Okay, that, that's kind of a downside for us. Now the final regulations adopt the proposed regulation, only minor changes. They did update a few things, you know, for like years or uh, years, effective date, et cetera, things that were changed by Secure 2.0 that really aren't subject to interpretation are in there as well. They did revise required beginning dates. I remember eventually the required beginning date moves to age 75 for those born after 1960. It is currently age 73, right? Basically, so you had a very short time period where 72 was the, was the apical age. We're gonna have age 73, 74, or 73, I should say, for those who do it now all the way until we get to those born in 1960. Those born in 1960, are going to see their required beginning date kick back two years, right? Okay. So again, it also said if it was a minor change, Secure 2.0, that's fine in these regs. But they did decide some Secure 2.0 issues impacting RMD issues needed to have new proposed regs. So what they did, they left the sections for those in these final regs as reserved, and then they put the reserved portion back in the other document which are our proposed regulations. Right. Now, the required distributions year one to nine were retained in the final regs. As I told you, you should expect that. But now I've been asked this a lot by people. There is nothing the IRS has published so far that suggests in any way, shape or form that you're gonna have to catch up. Let's say you, your, your taxpayer mom died in 2020 the taxpayer has taken no distributions in 21, 22, 23, 24. A lot of people seem to believe the IRS is going to say, well, in 25, you got to take all four of those distribution amounts plus whatever is due for 25. Does not say that. The regulation, because these notices all waive the penalties entirely, you just have to take the amount to be due in 25 by using a divisor. Now, your divisor would still go back to 21 and use the tables that existed in 21 and the age of the heir in 21, that appears to be what you do. And then you'd work that forward to 25, but you just take the 25 amount. That's all you have to do, right? You don't have to do a catch up in that. Um, does mean you need to tell your clients that yeah, 24, we still have the choice, 25 and later, you gotta take distribution or you're subject to penalties. And if your client runs a qualified retirement plan is defined contribution and they're paying out to decedents, yeah, they need to make sure that they, if they're paying out to decedents heirs, they need to make sure they follow this. Most retirement plans do not pay out to decedents heirs. And rather, they're allowed to roll that into an IRA, inherited IRA, right? Most plans aren't touching this. Maybe some very large ones might, but otherwise they tend not to touch this because it's more trouble than it's worth is what most of them consider. Now let's talk about the proposed regs and one very particular issue that's addressed there. 
Okay, this is reg 103, um, basically 529-23. This came out on July the 19th of 2024. By the way, the previous one was Treasury Decision 10001. Again, same date released. Now, these pro proposed regs, and it's, it's a much shorter document than the final regs, but it was issued to address items raised in Secure 2.0 Act that the IRS believes should be subject to comments before they're finalized. So again, these are subject to change. Now, I'm not going to cover most of them, but I'm going to cover one significant one, right? And that's a key drafting error in the Secure 2.0 Act that impacts only those individuals born in 1959 who have an IRA or a, well, a traditional IRA, I should say, or they have an interest in a defined contribution retirement account with their employer. Right, and so we're gonna to get to these special rules, right, assuming we're there. Now, the law provided for later required beginning date applicable ages, right? This is the age when we, att when we attain it, now we know that April 1st, the following year, will be our required beginning date, right? So that age was 72 in the SECURE Act. In the SECURE 2.0 Act, beginning in 2023, as I recall, the age went to 73 for those who attained age 73 before 2033, okay? So, you know, that's, that means for quite a while here, it's going to be 73 all the way through you know, age, you know, 2033. But after 2033, it's going up, right? And the law says it will then be 75 for those who attained age 74 after 2032. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a drafting error. Think about somebody born in 1959. They will be age 73 in 2032, right? So before 2033. That would make their applicable age 73, right? No problem there. We figured that out. Except they will also reach age 74 after 2033. After 2032, I should say, in 2033. And according to the very next provision of the law, that means that they were their Apple age be age 75. So they end up with two applicable ages. Now, how this happened, very simple. Originally, we were not going to jump uh, two years from 73 to 75. Rather, we were going to initially have an interim period where it went to 74 under the Secure 2.0 Act as initially drafted. Uh, in negotiations and to save a little bit of money, they basically removed that 74 age and basically kept 75. So I think it's pretty clear that the intent of that change was to keep 73 all the way until people born in 1960. Rather than giving an interim jump up, I think it was about five years in, where the age would have gone to 74. But the problem was how they made the change and made the edits. They didn't think it through. It really should be those who attain age 73 in 2032 or earlier will have an apple age of 73 and those who attain 73 later right will have the apple age be 75 but they screwed that up and basically that should be age 74 in 2034 that'd be your apple age of 75 yeah no that, that's not how it's going to work uh you know basically all those issues so it should be 2033, actually, the year those born in 59 would reach age 74. So now the problem is they they're both have a required beginning date that's April 1st of, in this case, 2033, but also would have a beginning date of April 1st, 2025. Well, you really can't have two of those. So the IRS is issuing regs now because they can't assume Congress will fix this. You know, Congress has not yet fixed it. There was hope they'd get something through this year. They never did. So it's not fixed. The IRS is going to resolve this issue by using the lower age. So what they're saying is if Congress does nothing before 2032, 2033 actually, you know, early 23, um, 
It's going to be age 73. Right? If they don't change it, age 73 for those born in 1959 will be what we're going to use. We're going to, have to take their distributions beginning at that point. And we're just going to treat the age, 70, uh, age 75 RBD as a non-existent thing since we, have to, we can only use one of them, right? Now, this should, be addressed, this should be addressed by Congress before this date comes up. That's the point of this, right? You get a ton of correction bills. Assuming one gets passed for 2032, you know, for the end of 2032, we should see this resolved. We know there should be technical corrections because there are problems in the Secure 2.0 Act. But Congress has yet to move on it, and I doubt they're going to move on it this year with an election year being in place. So, yeah, we're probably going to have a mess. And the only way Congress thinks they'll probably finally deal with this in December of 2032, just to totally foul up your planning for people who born, were born in 1959 on RMD. Uh, hopefully, the regulations will force Congress to act. Um, now, some people might say, wait, wait, you talked two weeks ago about this case called Loper Bright Enterprises in the Supreme Court that, you know, we got rid of Chevron deference. So is it possible that, in fact, the Supreme Court will say, or the Supreme Court or courts will strike this down, saying that, wait, no, th th this violates, you know, th this is not a proper interpretation of the law. And we don't, and even though it may be a, may be a reasonable one, it's not the best one. You know, because that, that's kind of what Loper Bright told us. We were looking for the best one using standard statutory interpretation tools. Is, is that, is that going to actually help this case? My own theory is, I don't know. First, Loper Bright has some interesting wording, especially you get further into the, into the opinion, that, you know, wonders about how exactly courts will make this call. And while it doesn't suggest you have to give absolute deference, it does suggest respect. And it's like, okay, what does that mean? Right? There's a lot of what does that mean courts going to have to address. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't yet say that Loper Bright Enterprises means all IRS regulations are invalid. I have have some people that seem to think that, but, you know, no. No, it just means that we have this. And, you know, they, they got, I was talking to somebody about the issue this week. And I said, you know, the further you get in the opinion, the more Weasley the opinion gets about exactly, well, how do we determine, you know, what we're doing here? And yeah, that, that was it. So we get into this. My own take, it seems unlikely they would disturb this because there's no real evidence what Congress actually thought. Or to the extent there is, I think it's clear that they thought that they were merely getting rid of 70 to 74. And so they get rid of that 74 time period, use 73 for that period, and then start 75 for the people born in 1960. The fact that they didn't draft language that said it that way is a totally different problem, right? It's a totally different issue. And basically, you know, it, it, it's one of those things. As a totally different issue, hey, we, we got a warning for a dust storm going off too. You probably hear that in the background. I'm going to try to kill that off here. Yeah, it's dust storms in Phoenix time. Know about that. So anyway, we got that coming up. So it seems unlikely a court would disturb this. There's no real evidence, right? I think the evidence we have suggests that they really meant it to be 74 all the way through people born in 1960, right? Also, age 73 distributions literally satisfies both rules. So in essence, 75 would totally, would not satisfy 73 in any way, shape, or form. That wouldn't be a distribution that would cover that requirement. So my own take is obviously courts can do anything. Uh, anything's possible, but I'm not betting right now that Loper is going to actually make a difference here. And remember, if in fact the language of a statute leads to one answer only, and you could argue that it's got to be 73 because only a, only a distribution starting day 73 would satisfy both requirements. So because of that, you could argue Congress needs to fix this. And let's be honest, especially after Loper, Congress has got to be a lot more careful and write laws to actually tell us what they mean. Don't, don't leave it. Don't write vague words and say it doesn't matter because the IRS will interpret this. And, you know, and due to Chevron, it'll count just like we wrote it. So it's no problem. It's like, no, no, no. Loper puts the burden on Congress to get these things right. How well they'll respond to that burden? I don't have a lot of confidence in Congress, but still. It is their issue now. They need to deal with it. Okay, this has been the Current Federal Tax Developments uh, for the week of April the 22nd 
of 2024, or should I April, July 22nd of 2024. Uh, as always, you can email me at zollerscurrentprotectionofwellness.com. I also do pay attention to the um, to the Connect sites for Arizona, New Jersey, Idaho, um, Minnesota, Illinois. So you can find me there as well if you have any questions. Otherwise, what we're going to watch, see what comes out this week in the area of taxes, see what else is up, and uh, just try to keep up to date on what's going on here in the area of federal tax developments.